Chapter Six of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. Although about two hundred students were assembled at Verrieres, there were only two classes in philosophy. With a group of one hundred to be taught, no pupil could receive individual attention. Learning had been hard enough for Jean Marie when Father Bailey could concentrate time and attention on him alone. Now he was almost frantic. He was sitting under a tree one day when a new student approached him. Sir, I wonder if you could explain this to me, the boy requested. I explain something? Jean Marie was amazed. Yes, father, I don't quite understand. But I am not an instructor, a priest. I am a student. You, a student? It was the boy's turn to be surprised. But you are a grown man. Jean Marie flushed and agreed. I supposed you had a long service in the army said the boy, finding this a natural excuse for the older student. No, I was not in the army, replied Jean-Marie. Well, then, you must be very stupid, observed the arrogant youngster. I believe I am, said Jean-Marie humbly. This incident began a purgatory of teasing, which Jean-Marie was to endure from the heedless and the malicious among his classmates. On the other hand, others among the students realized that there was something rare and unusual about the young man who worked so hard against seemingly overwhelming odds. The teachers, too, found student Vianney so worthwhile that an exception was made in his case. Instead of requiring him to recite in Latin, which always threw him into a panic, they allowed him to give his answers in French. Some of the students rebelled. Who is he that he should be given favors? A clumsy farm boy with no manners, others added. A simpleton. But among the wiser ones, more than one said, I'm sure he rates high in God's eyes. And before many months, even those students who had started out by making fun of their older classmate began to go to him for advice and encouragement in their problems. When they sought to consult him about some petty rivalry, some difficulty they were having, they always knew where to find him. He would be in the chapel, praying for help in his own problems. At the year's end, it seemed to him that he knew no more than he had in entering Verrieres. He was very homesick, completely discouraged, and more than a little tempted to give up the whole thing. I could help my father on the farm, he would think. He is growing old and could make good use of me. I'd work hard all day in field or vineyard, and in the evening I could teach religion to the children. That would be doing God's work. But then those thoughts would be swept away. God has called me to be a priest. I am sure of it. And in spite of the fact that he, the oldest student in the class, was at the tail end of it, his philosophy teachers were sure of his vocation, too. They sent him on to the major seminary at Lyons. There again he had a chance to practice humility. While the more perceptive and spiritual among the seminarians appreciated the true worth of the backward student, there were others who saw him only as a stupid butt for rather cruel wit, a figure of fun or scorn. He was industrious. There never had been a better worker at St. Irene. But in spite of that and of the further fact that the teachers gave him private tuition outside his classes, he could not seem to accomplish anything. A subject which he grasped in the quiet of his study left his mind entirely when he was questioned in class. Nevertheless, the rector of the seminary allowed him to continue his work there. "'We will wait and see how you do in the examinations,' he said to Jean-Marie. He, too, felt that there was something not at all ordinary in this young man, who worked so hard, who desired so fiercely to be a priest. Examination day came. For one of the few times in the history of the seminary, a candidate for the priesthood, received zero as his mark. In December 1813, a heartbroken Jean-Marie returned to Father Bailey to tell him of the disaster. I will never become a priest now, he said sadly. Of course you will, said Father Bailey sharply. You have been called and you will serve, but it won't be easy. Easy it certainly was not. In fact, it required a high form of heroism to disregard the raised eyebrows of some of the people in Eccoli, to start in again, trying to make his memory retain the lessons learned with such agonizing labor. The misery of those days would have been too great to endure if his ears had not rung with the echoes of Father Bailey's words. 
Don't worry. You will be a priest one day. As the weeks passed, Father Bailey grew to love and respect his people more and more. France was desperately in need of priests, he knew, since so few boys had found vocations during the reign of terror and the years which followed. He could not believe that the heart of God would not be moved to help a young man so determined to reach the altar. So Father Bailey intensified his efforts. This time he taught in French, and before long he rejoiced to see that Jean-Marie was getting a firm grasp on his lessons and retaining what he learned. When examination time came around again, Father Bailey went to Lyons with the request that his pupil be examined. He is a most remarkable young man, and I am sure he has a true vocation. I have the feeling that as a priest he will do very good work. The board of examiners, made up of the best theologians in the diocese, agreed to let young Vianney try. You must be very cool and calm, said Father Bailey when he returned to Jean-Marie. You know the answers to all the questions they might ask. Just think carefully and answer slowly. Don't get stage fright. But stage fright was exactly what Jean-Marie did get. When he saw the stern-faced examiners, he went into complete panic. Their questions he either didn't answer at all, or answered so incoherently that he might better have kept silent. Father Bouchard, chief of the examiners, was an old friend of Father Bailey. He tried to give the decision of the board as gently as he could. We do not find the young man at all ready, or ready for our diocese, at any rate. Perhaps somewhere else he could pass an examination, or he might serve God in another way. Father, please, no, he is a gem, this young Vianney, and we should make sure that he is a priest of this diocese. He was frightened today by all you grand people, and that is why he did so poorly. Father Bailey paused. Perhaps you could come to Eccoli tomorrow, and if possible, bring the vicar general with you. Examine Jean-Marie there. You will see that he is ready. The two priests did go to Eccoli, and in the quiet of the house he loved so well, Jean-Marie did much better so much better that the vicar general was convinced. We will accept him, he decided. We will work with him and do what we can. The grace of God must do the rest. On July 2, 1814, Jean-Marie Vianney received minor orders at the cathedral in Lyons, and in August of the next year, in the chapel of the seminary at Grenoble, he was ordained. The physical act of getting to his ordination had required some of the same courage and persistence needed in preparing for it. Austria was once again at war with France, and the country Jean-Marie covered on his sixty-mile walk from Ecolique to Grenoble was infiltrated with enemy troops, likely to begin action at any time. But that difficulty seemed slight to Jean-Marie when compared with those he had already overcome. After his ordination, he made a three-day retreat of thanksgiving, and then set out on a long walk back to Ecolique. There, to his great joy, he was to serve as assistant to his beloved curie, or, as we would say, pastor, Father Bailey. The people of Eccoli were as delighted to have Father Vianney with them as he was to be there. Father Bailey's joy was deep and very real. He was still a comparatively young man, but worn out by the hardships he had suffered during the terror. He saw much to be done, and knew that his own strength was limited. But he was so familiar with the consuming zeal and dogged determination of his former pupil that he counted greatly on the help the twenty-nine-year-old priest would give him. Yet the very unworldliness of Father Vianney, which made him so excellent a priest, created problems for the curie. The younger man was so intent on the spiritual life and priestly work that he had no interest at all in the world of appearances. While never dirty, he was almost always a little disheveled and shabby. At last Father Bailey could stand it no longer. He bought a complete new outfit for his curate, clerical frock coat, knee breeches, and fine black stockings. And shortly after he got them, Father Vianney had opportunity to wear them. Mrs. Vincent wants to consult me about the education of her sons, Father Bailey said one morning. I do not feel able to take the long walk. In any way, your advice will be as good as mine. So will you walk up there today and see her? If you wish me to, I do, and put on your new clothes. Spruce yourself up and do us credit. We don't want it said that the priests of Eccoli are Slovens, said the curie. Obediently, Father Vianney dressed in his new outfit. He stopped in at the church to say a prayer that his advice might be good, 
and then went his way in the sunshiny morning. Mrs. Vincent lived more than a dozen miles outside Eccoli, merely a pleasant walk for the former country boy. The afternoon was nearing its close when Father Bailey glanced out of his study window and saw a bedraggled tramp nearing the house. He was about to hurry out to the kitchen to prepare food for the man when a second glance showed him that it was no tramp but his own assistant. He sat down with a thump and waited for Father Vianney to come in. "'Good afternoon, Father,' the young man greeted his pastor. "'I think we have solved Mrs. Vincent's problems.' He paused, expecting to be questioned about the advice he had given, but there was silence of several minutes' duration. Then the curie spoke, spacing his words to give them weight. "'Father Vianney, what happened to your good clothes?' Father Vianney looked down at his ragged breeches and smiled. "'Oh, it was so fortunate,' he said happily. "'On the way home I met a beggar. He had lost everything, had no family, no home, and no hope.' I talked to him of the love of God, and when he seemed to be encouraged a little, I exchanged suits with him to help his confidence in Providence. There was another long silence. You were on the way back from Mrs. Vincent's. Yes, Father. Well, I can be grateful for that much anyway, said the pastor. The days and weeks and months went by. Father Bailey had long been noted as a preacher. Father Vianney was young and simple with much to learn but it was the masses and other services at which Father Vianney preached, which were crowded with attentive people, hardly breathing for fear they would miss a word. People came from surrounding towns to hear him, because, they said, he tells us what we need to hear. He had endless patience, especially with the children, spending hours with them teaching, explaining, and reteaching those who forgot. The children, as well as their parents, loved him dearly, and would have liked to include him in their simple social life, but he had no time for that. There were so many things to be done, and not enough hours in the day to do them. Then, too, the only intimates he wanted were Christ and his mother. The little boy who had always carried the statue of Mary with him was now the priest who always had her in his heart. Father Bailey was naturally delighted at the way his protégé had developed. Seeing that more and more parishioners were seeking out Father Vianney as confessor, he decided that he and the young priest should take up the study of theology again. In his early days as a student, we have seen, Jean-Marie had studied and been instructed in Latin, and Latin was always hard for him. Now that the curie instructed and discussed in French, learning for Father Vianney was no longer a feat of memory, but an exercise in understanding, in reasoning, and both priests were delighted at the progress made. These were happy days for the younger priest, and days of warm satisfaction for the older one, who knew now with certainty, if he had ever doubted it, that his efforts to see Jean-Marie ordained were more than justified. The rectory housekeeper, Mrs. Bibost, knew that the curate's bed was seldom slept in. She suspected that he spent most nights kneeling in prayer or sleeping on the board floor. She knew the tiny amounts of food the two priests allowed themselves. She did not know, could not even suspect, their private mortifications and penances. But she did know, and the whole parish knew, that they had two very saintly priests directing them. It was toward the end of 1816 that Father Bailey became ill, and most of the parish work fell on Father Vianney's shoulders. He became more haggard and weary, and also more shabby. One of the parishioners gave him cloth for a new cassock, and another supplied money to pay the tailor. "'When will you get your new cassock, Father?' he would be asked. Oh, soon, very soon, but I haven't time to see about it now. Before he found the time to see about it, and the tailor could set to work, Father Vianney had a visitor, a woman who came of a wealthy family, but who had lost her fortune, as well as her husband, during the wars. Sick and almost desperate, she came to the priest for advice. He talked with her a long time, and sent her away comforted. He felt, however, that he himself should do more. He hurried to the tailor's house to ask for the money deposited to pay for the making of his cassock. The tailor was not at home, and his wife was most unenthusiastic about their losing the job. She thought of all sorts of excuses for not relinquishing the money, but in the face of Father Vianney's persistence, she at last gave in. That night, Father Vianney secretly stole to the home of the woman who had called on him and left the money where she would find it in the morning. Before another attempt could be made to get the cassock finished, 
Father Bailey's illness took a mortal turn. The people of Eccoli were grieved by the death of the good old priest, who had served them so long and so well, but they found their grief lightened because Father Vianney was still with them. That he would be appointed curate, no one doubted. Even when young Father Trippier was sent to replace Father Bailey, the people, though surprised, were not deeply disturbed. They still had Father Vianney. Then in February of 1818, word was sent to Jean-Marie that he was to report to the office of the Vicar General of the Diocese. He was startled at what he was told there. About twenty miles from here, said Father Corbin, the Vicar General, is the little parish of ours. There is a chapel there without a pastor. The curie recently died. The people, I am afraid, are mostly a worldly and godless lot, with little interest in religion. The vicar general paused for a moment and studied the face of the priest before him, looking for signs of disappointment or displeasure. Father Vianney, he knew, had grown up largely in Eccoli. He had studied there, worked there, been happy and successful there. It would be quite natural to have at least a little regret about leaving it, especially since he would be going to a smaller, poorer, more indifferent parish. But no smallest sign of unhappiness appeared on Father Vianney's face. How do I get there? he asked. Ours is remote, Father Corbin said. It can be reached only by a narrow little road. But a cart can get through if you want to borrow one to carry your goods. How soon do you want me to be there, Father? Within two weeks, if you can manage it. The vicar general paused. I seem to remember that you were determined to become a priest in spite of odds against you, that you wanted to do God's work and teach his word. That is right, Father. Well, I must tell you this. When the reign of terror came and priests and sacraments disappeared, their disappearance from ours was permanent. The people there are cold and unfriendly, most of them. They feel that religion would interfere with their pagan way of life, so they keep religion out. A few will welcome you as a curie, but very few. On the whole, you will find that your presence is resented, your work ignored or hampered. They certainly need a priest, the people of ours. God bless you and give you strength for your work there. You'll need it. End of chapter 6 Recording by Maria Therese